Okay, well, I think it's close enough to 12.30 by my defective watch. Um, right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ed Diamond, as it says on there. Um, I am a professional Lego artist, so I work for a company called Brightbricks. So I own and run the company with my business partner. Um, and what we get to do all day is build with Lego bricks, and people pay us to do that, which is quite nice. Um, there's Duncan, I just mentioned earlier. He's the UK's only Lego certified professional. There are now only 12 of them in the world. Um, it's a program set up by LEGO that essentially allows people who have an existing business building models to actually get onto the program. They then have to follow a whole set of rules for LEGO, uh, pay an, an annual fee, uh, but then it also means that we get to order bricks directly from LEGO and we do quite a lot of work with LEGO UK making models of things like this Christmas tree. That was actually commissioned by LEGO as a, a, a model to promote the LEGO brand, so just to promote LEGO in general. It went up in St Pancras train station in London in 2011. You can see the train station in the background there. It was 12 metres tall, um, used 600,000 parts and weighed roughly three tonnes. Um, I'll come on a bit later to talk a bit more about the tree. But really what I'm here to talk about today is how I ended up doing this. Well, I started quite young. Actually, I'd already been building Lego for probably about two or three years by the time this picture was taken in 1978 when I was six. And that was me with my model of the CN Tower in, uh, in Toronto, sorry, in Canada. At least I thought it was a model of the CN Tower at the time. I thought it was amazing, you know, these days it's, it's okay, but I suppose for a six-year-old, that's quite good. Um, I carried on building all through my childhood years. Um, when I became an adult and went to university and stuff, I didn't build quite as much, but then I got my bricks out a few years later and started building some big models. Um, this is one of the first really big models I built. Um, it's a spaceship called the Maddox. It's about eight feet long. That's my beautiful wife there, who's there for a sense of scale, so that you can actually get an understanding of how big the model was. Um, quite often, if you build a Lego model, especially if you build it with nice, smooth surfaces and hide all the studs, then people don't tend to get an idea when you take a picture of it of quite how big it is. So it's useful to put somebody in the picture to, to get an understanding of just how big things are. So I built that um, about ten years ago. Um, I stuck a picture of it online, I found this weird website uh, called Brickshelf, and I put it on there. And then discovered there was a whole other world of people out there. I got contacted by an American guy who said, Oh, your spaceship's amazing, and I've stuck it on this thing called Classic Space. Really, what's that meant? And I went on there, and there was all these people talking about it, and they were talking about other spaceships, and I saw all these other amazing spaceship models. And then discovered a thing called Brothers Brick, where if you go onto that website, they trawl the internet on an almost daily basis looking for all the coolest LEGO models and they put them up on the website. Um, then I discovered that there's places you can go and buy LEGO bricks, like Bricklink, where you can just go and buy individual bricks. And then I started ordering the bits I really needed for the models I wanted to make. Put pictures up on photo sharing sites like Flickr, and then stumbled across this thing called the British Association. Um, most of the people you see here displaying models uh, are members of the British Association. It's the adult fan club for LEGO in, LEGO in the UK. Um, and I, I joined that and started going to shows like this. So I've been coming, this is my eighth, I think, um, time at Steam. Bought various big models along. Um, when I discovered the British Association, I went along to some of their events. This is one of the Christmas parties from about seven or eight years ago. Um, and this map was built by my business partner, Duncan. So back then, I just knew him as this other guy who built weird stuff. Um, this is a London Underground map, and you can see some bags in the, thing, in the background to get a sort of sense of size. It's nearly six feet wide and just under four feet high, so it's a pretty big model. Um, it's got all the station names on it and the colours of the lines and everything. Um, the funny thing was that we did that, he did that just for fun years ago, and then earlier this year, because it's the 150th anniversary of London Underground, we got commissioned to make um, five different maps that are on different tube stations all over London, going through the history of how the tube map has developed. So that was quite fun. So. He basically said, my business is going really well, do you want to sort of buy into it and carry on doing it some more? And we said yes, I thought maybe I'd do it for a, a short while and see how it goes, see if I want to move out of my job. Within three months I quit my full-time job and was doing this full-time and now there's eight people working for us, so it's been a pretty crazy 18 months. Um, one of the things I discovered fairly, uh, well, after a little while of building models, that Maddox spaceship you saw earlier was built as one giant piece, so in order to carved it around, you needed to move a fairly heavy eight foot long model. When I started building large ships, I realised that the only sensible way of doing it was to do what we call modular building, where you actually break the model down into bits. So this aircraft carrier, this is a, a photograph of the 
um, USS Intrepid aircraft carrier I built is built at the scale of little Lego men, so it's actually nearly uh, seven meters long, it's about six and a half meters long, um, 250,000 quarter of a million Lego bricks, and it's all built in sections. This is a, a very lovely photograph that was taken by Ian sitting over there, his lovely wife in there, and this guy James who's currently running the big castle display over there, so this was four years ago in here. Um, the hull, the, the hull and the deck is all built in sections, so the flight deck is in slices, there's around 12 of them down the length of it, the island superstructure lifts off, all the guns pull off, and then the hull is in six sections, they just rest next to each other, so you just have to make sure you're building the same cross-section from each section so that they all slide together. And that way you can actually pick up each section, put it in a packing case, and the whole thing can be moved. And um, that's now on display in New York on board the actual ship in Intrepid. So it's a model of itself on board itself. So if you ever get to New York, you can go to the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum and see the real thing. So this was the first really big build that we did, um, the Lego Christmas tree. It used a similar concept of a modular build. So each of the branches here is a separate item that slots onto a steel trunk in the middle. Lego all over those, and it means that obviously we can detach each branch, we stack them on big frames, and then you can be shipped around so it's in storage at the moment, but we can take it out and set it up. So in order to build that, um, it turned out to be quite a, quite a challenge, because there are, when you do things professionally, there are all sorts of things you have to take into consideration. Um, health and safety executives, health and safety, you're going to put up a three-ton tree in a station where there's going to be lots of public, there are lots of things you have to think about so that you don't kill people. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, English Heritage is one of the interesting ones. Uh, so people like Network Rail and the station obviously you have to deal with them and say what their rules are about how they have contractors on site and all those sorts of things. But from an English Heritage point of view, St Pancras Station is a listed building. So you can't go around tampering with it or doing any strange things. You can't bolt it to the floor or anything like that or drill holes in the metalwork around to anchor cables to it and everything. So we had to come up with a method that will allow it to stand on a sort of rubber matting so it protects the floor and, and have guy wires that were just on clamps so they weren't actually screwed to anything. And then the other issues we had were things like we wanted to put some Christmas tree baubles on it but we figured that we actually need about 1200 baubles so we came up with a, a design for those um, and then we got the scouts and the primary school to actually build them so that saved us having to build 1200 baubles for which I was very thankful. In terms of size, obviously LEGO wanted it to have a really big impact, so we had to make it as tall as we could, but in a sensible reason. Um, the silhouetted figure there is a, a sort of 1.8 metre tall person, something like this tall, um, and that gives you an impression of scale. So what we did was we, we computer digitised one branch, and then we then stuck those around and copied that up and up and up and up so that you get some impression of the scale of things so that the people commissioning could see roughly what it would look like and how big it would look compared to people, so big is the answer. So this is a, a close-up inside the workshop that we had at the time of how we were building the branches. You can see one lying on the table here, you've got a, a central steel bit that you can't quite see that runs up under there, and steel bits sticking out and they're all completely clad in Lego. And we very fi early figured on that we could use a technique for the whole thing, it's essentially taking a one by brick, so that's a one by eight Lego brick, and then each of these is a one by four Lego brick, and by putting them on alternating studs, you can then twist it at 45 degrees, clamp it with another little plate on top, and you just repeat that whole process over and over again to build the branches. You can then have twigs coming out with pine needles on each of those, so that you just go from a bigger branch to a smaller branch to a smaller branch to a needle, and then just repeat that exercise. And you do that for hundreds of branches, hundreds of twigs, and you end up with a Christmas tree. So, we had to put it up overnight, uh, it's a busy working station, we can't just go in there and put it up whenever we want. So, every night for 10 nights we'd start working at 10pm and finish at 4am. Uh, so one good thing about St. Pancras Station, there is a 24 hour cost of coffee there, so we were able to stay well awake by using that. You can see here where we're actually doing night by night, putting more and more branches on the tree. Eventually, obviously, we have to use a cherry picker to get higher up and put branches further up the tree. We're building the Lego trunk as we go. Lots of you looking up through the branches, so you can see the way in which we staggered them so that you end up with this very tree-like pattern. You see all the branches and needles going up through the tree. Um, that's a quick demonstration of how the, the walls of the tree were built. 
uh, it's a fairly standard sort of thing that we use when we're doing workshops and parties and things of how to make square bricks round. So you're using these pieces that anyone in the last talk may have heard Megan talking about the we nickname those the Dalek because they've got dots all around them, but essentially they're a little one by one brick with studs on either side. If you put a load of those together, you eventually form a cube, and then on the surfaces of the six sides of the cube, by st stacking plates on top of each other, you create a bit of a dome shape, put those all together, you end up with something that's, that's fairly spherical for such a small object. And we had little strings attached on top of those, hang 1200 off of those off the tree, red, blue, white, and so on, and they look like nice Christmas tree baubles. You can see a few of them hanging on there. I put some lights on, and then finally it's Duncan putting the star on the top of the tree, which was quite nerve wracking. I suffered with vertigo, so I didn't go right there. And he went right up to the top of the tree. The star itself is about 800 millimetres high, so about that tall off the ground. He uses several thousand parts just for the star. And we covered it in lots and lots of the little transparent elements that you use on car headlights and things, because we put those on, they catch the light and they sparkle, so the, the star did sort of twinkle in the light. So we'd successfully done that, and then last year uh, we got contacted by Rolls Royce. They'd seen the tree, thought it was amazing, and said, Can you build a jet engine? Yeah, sure, why not? I'm sure that, that's easy, isn't it? Um, so we talked to them, we sat down, had a discussion about what they wanted to do. Um, and for Farm Bray Show last year, they wanted to promote engineering and look at getting children into engineering and, and that as a, as a, as a full concept. Um, and because of Lego, obviously it was Charles Century, they thought, well, we would have let it a uh, jet engine out of Lego put it on the stand and use it to promote their engineering schemes. So we built a Trent 1000, which is the engine that goes in a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. We did initially talk to him for about two minutes about the idea of doing it full-sized, and then went, that's just crazy, because it's three metres across and nearly five metres long, so you know, we ruled that out for the night time being, although maybe in the future we'll have a crack at doing a full-size one. <laughs> uh, they also wanted it to work, so that's how we ended up with the, 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 the blades turning. Some of you may, if you've been in the other hall, seen the sort of videos we're running in there that show how these things are done, but I will run the video for how we make a Rolls Royce jet engine. That's just me saying, hmm, Ed, hello, this is a jet engine, this is what we're going to build. So we order parts directly off of Lego, so we end up with these bag fulls of Lego, we just order it by individual part and individual colour, and we say we want 20,000 loads or whatever it might be. This is Naomi on speed up time lapse building fan blades, and um, that's Annie, my wife, building one of the central hubs that's actually going to hold all the fan blades on. And it's all built in these repeating sections so that you can have people building bits of it fairly quickly. They then all pin them together, and that forms the hub. And that's me pinning them together, trying to actually build the shape of the hut, and you start to see it's forming a, a big black ring shape. All pins together. And eventually you attach 20 fan blades to that, and you end up with that. A giant Lego fan that's on the front of the engine. Pretty hefty thing to pick up, but you can just about pick it up and rotate it onto the central shaft. And then more things being built there. Well, we've never noticed that before, actually. My wife's Lego Tasmanian Devil from Warner Brothers. So then we start assembling everything onto the steelwork. We've got the cowling, we've got some compressors going on here. You can see the fan blades already on. That over there is the core that goes on here that holds all the struts. There it's gone on. The struts are going on to support the cowling. We're putting more compressors on, some of the details. And now they're building the back end behind the turbine housing. So at the very back end of the engine you see this big ring and the smaller ring in the middle and the air passes between the two. And those are the turbines passes out through there. So as the air gets exploded and blown out the back, it drives the turbines and that pushes the whole thing around. So it's self-sustaining a jet engine. More compressors going on. Building the housing that goes around the outside. And then this is a second section of cowling that gets lifted up and stuck onto the back here. Uh, at the time we hadn't really thought that one through and then until we came to do it we realised when we counted it up there's over 500 Lego studs on the top edge of that cowling and you've got to try and put that on and connect that with 500 sockets and if you've ever tried to put two large plates in Lego together and realise how hard that is to do trying to do it with over 500 studs and it's curved is really difficult so we did that um, went all through the, sort of into about two o'clock in the morning using ratchet straps and things to clamp the whole thing together and after about four and a half hours managed to pull that together. 
and then we just see we're putting the last bits of casing on to marry up with this. We had to keep jigging that around to make sure it didn't clash with this when you switched it on so the whole thing didn't just destroy itself. A few finishing touches like pipe work and things going on. And just coming towards you. And there you have the finished Lego Jet Engine. So when we're actually considering doing a build like this, uh, obviously what we also need to do is have a lot of planning and research and understanding of how you might go about building one. So Rolls-Royce supplies with a lot of cross-section engineering drawings, so they cut through like that. This is actually a photograph I took because they sent me up to Derby to go onto the production line. So I wandered all around the production line in Derby, saw how they built the real engines, took lots of photographs from every angle I could think of, and then used that to calculate all the dimensions and everything we need to make the engine. Uh, it was a very interesting visit. It's a fascinating place. You don't really want to touch everything because you walk past something and say, oh, that's a quarter of a million pounds for one of those and half a million pounds for one of those. And like, mm. um, when I was up on a gantry taking a photograph of the engine, though, there was a very familiar experience. One of the engineers was working with the sort of rotary um, trolleys that they have that have all the little nuts and bolts in so that everything's labelled and they count them and they have to be very careful that they know exactly what they're doing. And she pulled out a drawer and it went too far and spilled nuts all over the floor and I just looked at it and thought that looks just like what I do with Lego bricks. Yeah. I let her clean them up itself. So in terms of building some of the parts of it, the fan blades are one of the more complicated things on it because the shape has almost no straight lines, it's got curved edges, it's twisted, it curves around, it's mounted at a funny angle. So I sat down just with a pile of Lego grey plates and started sticking them together and trying to work out the shape. It actually took me five attempts to end up with that. And what I did was, in order to allow other people to make it, is colourise it so that every layer of plate in here is a different colour. And obviously that all then got built in grey, but it allows you to see how the plates are stepped and staggered on top of each other to form curves. So if you take the small, thin Lego elements and keep sticking them at different angles and fiddling around with them, you can create curves, angles, bends, and put that into a computer, digitised it, and then got somebody else to make the other 19, because I thought, you know, I've made one, that's my, my contribution. We then also sometimes get to do slightly different things, so the jet engine's an engineering thing, we do quite a lot of engineering builds, but then we get asked to do really strange things. So, the outlet store across the way, first of all, got us to do a giant handbag when they opened an Osprey store, so we did a 10 foot high Osprey handbag. Then after that they were going to open a Kirk like a shoe shop, so we did one of those. We've also now done a giant watch, but uh, this is a, a, a bit of a film about how the actual shoe got made. Okay, so when we made the shoe, they sent us a, a copy of this rather interesting Kurt Geiger shoe, it's called Esme. I don't know why it's called Esme, but it's called Esme. And it's a very interesting pink stiletto. So the first thing we did was draw a pencil outline on a piece of card following the shape of the actual shoe which we'd sketched earlier. We then used that template to follow to build the foot of the shoe, keep turning it over to build the fact that it curves up on the bottom. Bring that in, now we're getting onto the inside of the shoe. So we'll start laying out the, the sort of dark tan leather colour that goes on the inside. And there it is. Pink up the side of the shoe and the leather on the toe. And then we had to build these funny little gold coloured pointy cone bits which are little spikes on the shoe. And what we're doing here is layering brick, and it's similar to the plate for the fan blade, but on a larger scale, we're stepping the Lego in and up so you form curves of Lego with the bricks, and that forms this stepped shape. You can do it more slowly to get steeper angles, and then as you bring the bricks in more quickly, step them in, you end up with curves going the other way. The same coming up here. It's me going frantically going around there. The, the heel is made out of gold Lego bricks. They do bit for one for a little short while, do two by four standard bricks in gold, so it's made out of those. And this is the guy building the plinth, they wanted it stuck on a nice mirrored shiny plinth. That bit's not like gold, right? 
and then and there it is being installed in the outlet centre. So we've set the plinth up so it's got a rotating top. And set it running and the shoe spins around on the plinth. So that's the Lego shoe. Uh, so we do get asked to build some strange things in our time. After the success of the Christmas tree, we moved on to doing something else for Christmas. So for last Christmas, we built this giant advent calendar. And it's uh, actually going to be installed in Leeds this Christmas. So if any of you are from Leeds or going anywhere near Leeds over the Christmas period, you're going to see it up there. I'm not sure exactly where, but it'll be advertised fairly heavily, I imagine. Um, it's an interesting build because the basic structure of it was just a very big modular thing, rather like my ship. So if you imagine lying one of these sections down on its side, it would form something similar to the hull of a ship. But it was an interesting build from the point of view that because there are 24 windows for the advent calendar, we got to build lots of fun little models to go inside them. So you can see someone's arm there. The whole model is around three meters high and five meters wide, built in four big sections, and then six windows in each section. So it's just a big box built out of bricks. So clouds in that one to make it look interesting. That's a starry night sky in the black one there. So, so we did all of that. And then it was unveiled on the 1st of December. Uh, the front of it is a huge mosaic. One of my colleagues is a very good illustrator, so he came up with a, an image which we digitized and turned into a mosaic. He used about 200,000 one by one bricks to form this giant picture. Trees, snowflakes, houses. So that's all what you can see on that surface is just the top of one by one bricks studs covered the whole thing in that and then when it was open we had a reindeer on the 1st of December and we had this nice young lady with two reindeer that came along and we opened it and then every single day obviously as an advent calendar would be we open up the doors so we had all the fun we built things like a turkey with asparagus and bits of mushroom and various things like that and this little chap here is called Jeffrey he's an elf uh, we started building the elf and then one of the people from the PR agency said that looks just like one of our colleagues called Jeffrey and we'd met him and said yeah, it does. So we had a specially printed little tile with one by two tiles that says Jeffrey on it and stuck that on him. So he became Jeffrey, sort of a little mouse and a hole in his skirt and pulled a pot of paint. And I figured he's, he's hard work, so I gave him a nice mug of steaming coffee to keep him, keep him happy. Uh, we did fun other things, a Christmas wreath, and uh, that's the fairy for the top of the tree that I built. And with our experience in trees, earlier this year we got to go out to Doha in uh, Qatar and build a giant Lego tree. Again, there's a time-lapse video of that which you can see running in the other hall. Um, it's for a toy store and it has about 150,000 bricks in it. When we turned up, we were expecting it to be a, an almost completed airport, but really it was pretty much a building size. You can see from all the hanging plastic and the dots of light that come from sort of arch lamps and card on the floor, dust everywhere. So it was a pretty challenging thing. The temperature was about 40 degrees in Qatar at that point in time. Um, and we had to build it on site because essentially what's behind it is a 900mm diameter concrete pillar. So this toy store is going to be a, a fantastic place because it's, going to, it's got giant animatronic dinosaurs, it's got a laser light show, it's got a holographic glow that gets projected on the floor, a huge conveyor belt of toys that goes around the tree. And because they had this concrete pillar and they thought that's really ugly, what can we do? They said, let's clad it in 150,000 Lego bricks and make a tree. So we actually sat down the site with a a rough plan of where the roots and the branches would go, put some steel in to hold the branches up and then built this over the period of two weeks, three of us just working like crazy people, and gluing that all together to build a tree. Um, as you've seen from the fact that I built a ship, I also tend to like building aircraft and ships, that's what I used to build as a Lego fan, quite a lot of. Um, and we got commissioned recently and they contacted us and said, can you build us a, an Airbus A380? And I went, oh, yes, please. Um, so unlike a lot of the models, uh, I built all of that to myself because I didn't want anyone else to have a go. So um, it's about 1.3 meter, 1.35 meter wingspan, about 1.3 meters long. So a bit shorter than that table. And if you've seen Ralph's B52 in the other hall, it's a, it's a little bit smaller than that, and I'm sure we'll point that out in a minute. Um, that's quite a fun build. Things like the actual British Airways logos, we tend to get custom stickers done if it needs to be something very precise. So British Airways obviously want their logo to look perfect, so we put a nice vinyl sticker on. But the tail, I did have the opportunity to go to town and actually build the logo into the tail. The way of doing that sort of technique is to simply get an image of the tail, print it out at exactly the size you need it to be, so you can scale it up and down and then measure it to see that you've actually printed it out the right size, and then lay it on the table and start with small plates, one by two, one by three, one by four, the little Lego plates, and you just stack them on top of each other following the profile, 
thing and like to follow the profile again. Oh, it took about a day just to build the tail on its own, but you end up with quite a nice finished effect. So, uh, again, with the more unusual things, this year um, there was a competition run by Chat Magazine for heroes, uh, and it was basically for people who've done interesting things. And this young boy, Jack, who's 10 year old, um, actually raised money for a cancer charity nearby creating his own sponsored run, got about 3,000 people from his school and community to run in that. Um, and so he won the magazine prize, uh, and the prize was to have himself built out of Lego. So we got Jack down to our studio, sat him down, took lots of photographs of him, spun him around on a typing chair so he could get lots of pictures of his head from all around to see what that looked like. Took various pictures of him in different poses, copied one of those, I, I built his head. Uh, building human heads is one of the most difficult things to do in Lego because the human brain is very used to picking up incredibly small differences in someone's appearance. So you can immediately recognise family members and friends out of a crowd of hundreds of people because we're so used to looking for features and faces. So it took about a week and a half just to build his head by moving individual plates in and out and go, that looks a bit more like him, that looks a bit less like him, that looks a bit more like him. And you just keep doing that over and over again until eventually uh, it matches with lots of printouts of the photograph. Went on display in Legoland for about a month, and it's now sitting in his home and is referred to as Jack 2. Um, in terms of its future, um, we keep expanding. We've moved into an even bigger studio now. It's three times the size of the last one. We're doing another huge Christmas build in the UK. So if you're up in Covent Garden in, towards the end of November or December, there will be a great big lego -y type thing. I can't tell you what it is, but if you've seen a Christmas tree, you've seen an advent calendar, you can try and figure out yourself what it might be. Um, and just as a sort of last thing before I turn over to some questions and very quickly get off before Ralph eats me. Hello Ralph. <laughs> um, let's just play... I'm just building the advent calendar. When we do our work at Milestones Museum in Basingstoke every year, we'll be there again next February with a big display. Um, we do some models that go around some other museums in Hampshire, and this went to a uh, museum in Andover for Dengbury Hill Fort, which is an Iron Age hill fort. And this model was quite a lot of fun because it was essentially a minifig scale model, so it's very much like the sort of dioramas you see in there. We don't often get to do that. And so what we were doing was recreating what the Iron Age hill fort would have looked like back in the Iron Age period, because now it's just a an earth and there's not really much there. Um, so you can see we're putting in the, the earth bank embankment, then we're getting a farmer's field with some oxen, ploughing fields and pigs, and a blacksmith doing his work there. Lots of cute little details, some guys on the ground, a fire here with smoke coming with it, a goat going for sacrifice, or just being taken for a walk, I don't know. <laughs> um, nice little thatched huts, the chieftain and the shaman. Some pathways and a fence along the top there. And some warriors. It's the sort of thing you get to pack lots and lots of detail into, so it's a lot of fun because there's, there's not much repetition to the build, there's lots and lots of things going on. Um, and you might be able to be doing a few more of those for, for museums around the place, and that's the sort of finished thing it looks like. So, that's how I came to be doing what I'm doing, um, and I think at this point I'll just turn it over and say, does anybody have any questions? Sorry, just a little, I'm going to stop this thing for a moment. Yes, sorry. How much Lego does your company keep on site? Like you see all the wind bricks for large event, for large models. So how, how big a reserve do you have? Um, we're trying to build up a reserve all the time because essentially a lot of people will contact us and say we want a model and they might have only a four or five week turnaround. And when we order parts from Lego, it usually takes five to six weeks perhaps for us to get the parts. So whatever we're doing with quickly, we like to have a lot of bricks in. So at the last count, we've got roughly eight and a half million bricks in the, in the, in the warehouse, um, which is an area about half the size of that hall in there with shelving three meters up in the air and, and, and everywhere and then stored in boxes and things. So quite a lot, is it? Our security system is absolutely faultless. We have somebody living in the building 24-7. As well as alarms and cameras and various other things. So. I'm not telling you where it is. <laughs> What's the question back there? What 
Um, I think personally probably the jet engine is my favourite because I was the one in charge of doing that one so I, I, I like that a lot. The Airbus is quite a lot of fun too um, and I think Duncan, my business partner, is very proud of the tree because it was really the, the model that launched now our company really. Um, the jet engine took around three months to make. There were up to ten people working at any point in time but probably a core of around four or five for most of that three months. Okay, well I think uh, my, my time is up anyway, so I just remain to say uh, thank you very much, enjoy the rest of your visit and stay and listen to Ralph talk because it's good. <laughs> Thanks.